Hello, my name is Tammy Rose and welcome to Concord Days. A million birds sang, wrote Margaret Fuller. The woods teemed with blossoms. The sod grew green hourly over the graves of the mighty past. The surf rushed in on a fair shore. The Tiber magnetically retreated to carry inland her share from the treasures of the deep. The sea breezes burnt my face, but revived my heart. I felt the calm of thought, the sublime hopes of the future, nature, man, so great, though so little, so dear, though incomplete. That was from the Roman years of Margaret Fuller. And I am very pleased to be able to welcome Dr. Roseanne Welsh, who is the executive director of the Stevens College program for the MFA, um, and who is an author on many topics in American history and American culture. Welcome, Roseanne. Thank you so much for having me. I love to talk about these things, as you know. Exactly, exactly. So can we start with um, your, your, how did you first discover Margaret Fuller? I discovered her a roundabout way. I would say I first had her mentioned when I was in eighth grade in Ohio and we studied Ohio history, which was abolitionist and really got into we're on the right side of the Civil War. Um, and John Brown was somebody very important to the because he's from Ohio. So very proud that he was anti-slavery. And I started to learn about abolitionists. And then you forget you go to college, I was studying theater, but I needed a class once, an elective desperately to fill out my schedule. And the only thing available was this transcendentalism class. And I had completely forgotten anything I might have learned previously and I begged to get in the class and he let me in and there I found Margaret among all these other gentlemen and it was another one of those examples of wait it sounds like women never did anything until the modern day but they always did they just got left out of the history books so I was I was enthralled to find a woman with such a modern mind in that time period Exactly. And and let's sort of go through her life, sort of hit the major time periods before she gets to Italy, because she's in Italy at the very end of her life. So she was born in 1810 in Cambridgeport, Massachusetts, which is like 10 miles away from Concord. And she was kind of born into the world of, you know, she grew up playing with Thomas Wentworth Higginson, you know, and she very quickly met Emerson and, and fell in with the transcendental crowd just as they were actually starting to get going. Exactly. And I think it's important that she worked, you know, when she did her early teaching and things like that, she worked with Bronson Alcott, who was also someone that we all knew Louisa May Alcott, which we should. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it was later that I learned her father was involved and, you know, was maybe not one of the most successful transcendentalists, but was trying with ideas like an integrated school. And it was hurting him financially. Um, and Margaret was part of that, right? Supporting that. So you can see early on when I used to teach um, a straight history class, I would often compare this era of the transcendentalists and all the utopian societies to the 1960s. Yes. Because we have that same urge going on, make the world a better place. And I love that. And most people, we know about the 60s, we've, we've seen it in movies and stuff, but they really don't know that that urge happened so much earlier and that women were part of it. Exactly. Well, and, and the women were part of it, kind of whether they wanted to be or not, because these utopian societies were maybe designed by men. You know, Bronson was kind of like, all right, this is how I want to run the school. I want to be open and honest with the kids. And even Elizabeth Peabody, you know, she wrote a book called, you know, the, 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 or the, the history of, of that school. And, uh, you know, in it, she's like, you know, we we told the children the, the right answers to all the questions that they had, including when they asked about sex. You know, we told them honestly. Which other groups had done, other religions had done. Right. I remember when I first heard the Puritans would do that thing where if you were with someone, you might. Oh. Sex. Earlier. Oh, wait. Say that again. Say that again. We just you cut out for a second. The um, I remember the Puritans had that system where if you were visiting overnight, someone you might marry, they would lock a board between you and wrap you up so you could be together but not actually have sex. So they knew sex. They talked about sex and they wanted to be careful about it. Right. Um, 
Yeah, exactly. So funny. Yeah. Well, and, and Margaret, I think, was especially aware of issues about being a woman in like a male society and issues of marriage and how it was very hard to actually have a, a, a an equal balance between two intellectual individuals because it was not something that she had generally seen or that generally happened. It, didn't. Uh, it wasn't um, it wasn't socially acceptable. Women were supposed to accept that even if you were semi smart, if had if you been, had been allowed some learning, which she got lucky because her father believed in that, then you gave that up when you went home and then you just take care of the kids if you got married. Right. 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 And and like her father training her when she was a kid, like this is not a little thing. He was a strict disciplinarian and wanted her to be translating the Aeneid by the time she was 10 without any hesitation and without any errors. And she had nightmares as a child because he was holding her up to such a high standard. But I think she she lived by that high standard for the rest of her life and it got her all over the place. It did. And I often compare her when I was talking to students about her, I compare her to John Quincy Adams, right? Who at 10 was translating his own father's paperwork and knew five or six languages. And he's going to be like, in my opinion, our smartest president. So she's on par with him, but not given the opportunities. Exactly. And even in her day, she was known as the most widely read woman in America. And she talked her way into the Harvard library, even though she couldn't actually attend Harvard, you know, and she made sure that she could get the education that she wanted. She must have had this like internal drive and curiosity that just kept her going throughout her life. And she's constantly reinventing herself. Um, like that, the, one of my favorite things about her is the, the conversations that she had with women, which are kind of like modern day podcasts where it's mm-hmm. like, let's just get everybody together and just talk, you know? Well, that's, and, and that goes into the 1960s, their rap sessions, right? That's exactly. what, and we're, we're, you know, consciousness raising. And yep. in, in every generation, like we often teach that the beginning of women's, right? Whatever, yeah. you know, you can go back to Mary, Wollst- Mary um, Wollstonecraft, right? And then think yeah. about that's England. But here in America, those same conversations are being had. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I feel like she had to do so much fighting and, or not even like necessarily fighting, but just like to reaffirm her right to be in that room or to, you know, be working as a correspondent for Horace Greeley's paper. Uh, Because I I also, like when it comes to the transcendentalists, um, one of the big things is also the dial, right? That's the biggest magazine. That's the thing that sort of um, cements the idea of the transcendentalists and all these writers get published there. Um, And Emerson had asked her to be the main editor and he said that he was going to pay her, and then he never ended up paying her. <laughs> exactly. So that, that she didn't even like get a free place. She didn't even get a free place, a cabin on his land to live. Right, right. Like his friend, you know. Uh, but I and and you know, he would always put her up in his house whenever she wanted to come to visit Concord. She had an open invitation, but you know, his wife Lydia didn't necessarily appreciate it, and it wasn't the best of relationships. So I and I feel like Margaret was never really maybe comfortable in the conquered world because they, the guys here just didn't understand how to deal with her. Nor did the women, right? Because you have to imagine they were probably had, they had some education, they knew they could do more, but weren't allowed to. And then here's this woman who's getting to, so there's going to be this under, you know, layer of kind of jealousy, but I don't want to be jealous, but I want that, but I can't have it. Yeah. 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 And I feel like the guys were also challenged in a similar way where it's like, all right, this is, you know, I like most of them were married or celibate or whatever. This is not a romantic relationship. And, you know, this is not a woman who is only worried about, you know, you know, her bonnet or her, you know, her jewelry or whatever. This is a woman who has intellectual conversations. So this is somebody that they're, you know, attracted to, but also, you know, maybe scared of or intimidated by. Um, I think Hawthorne felt that way too, you know, coming across her um, and, you know, he, he incorporates her in, you know, and it depends who you, who you read or believe, like she could be the inspiration for the Scarlet Letter, or she could be the inspiration for somebody in Blythdale Romance, or, you know, I think, and I think Hawthorne was a user of the, like a pastiche and combined a lot of people into his characters, but. I think that's true. And I think, you know, it's such an interesting thing because they, They spouted ideas about equality, but it's a different thing to have the intellectual idea that women should be. And then here's like, you use the word intimidated. And I think that is the perfect description because 
imagine like, well, I said it could happen, but I didn't know I'd run into someone who's going to challenge my, I'm the smart guy in the room. Like <laughs> you, you get that right. I'm yeah. you can. Yeah. Yeah. You can see how that would have, it would have shocked them and maybe their own wives had that capacity, but weren't given the ability to show it off. Exactly. Exactly. Like everybody's in slight competition with each other, you know, but everybody's wants to be in this creative community where they also encourage each other. But there's always this like, who are you and sizing each other up. And, you know, it, it was great that she was able to um, be an editor for Thoreau, especially early on. And I feel like that enabled him to understand and maybe, um, you know, it maybe grounded him a little in his own writing. Because by the time you started writing Walden, he went through eight different editions, you know, before he actually got to something that he felt like he could publish. And I felt like, I think that having a strong editor like Margaret to call him on all of his, you know, um, easy phrases, that 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 has, has got to have been part of an influence. Well, and it probably intimidated him because with her training as a news person, you don't get to do 8,000 versions. Bam, you got to kick it out. This is it. I just wrote the article. It's published tomorrow. I, no one's fussing with it because I can think quickly. I can edit in my mind. Yeah. So, yeah. She was bringing that to him and that's not his talent. Exactly. Exactly. So, so, you know, she's, she's growing up in the Massachusetts area, um, doing the dial, you know, working on the transcendentalist stuff. And then she, you know, starts working for Horace Greeley and then is becoming a correspondent for him. And the, and she goes to Italy, which is sort of the main, the main thrust of the conversation that I want to have today. So can you sort of pick up the story from there? Like, why does she go to Italy? What is going on? And what is she excited about? You know, Italy, we forget because we had our founding, right? But in Italy, they were a scattered of different city-states, basically, up until we're talking the 1860s is when this finally gets settled. And it's in the 1830s that this roiling begins. We should be all one country. Remember the Roman Empire? We own the whole world. Now we can't even own this little boot that's part of us. Right. So there was and, a lot and, of- and, and Italy was all these like little like city-states, and it wasn't really the Italy that we know no. today. Austria owned some parts of it, right? And Fran- France owned some parts of it. Sicily was its own country. It was not part of Italy, like ever. My joke, I have Sicily relatives that I visited, and they always say, come there if you're traveling in Europe because you see Greek ruins and Roman ruins and you know mosques. Everybody, everybody invaded Sicily and took over at some point. So it's like the whole world in a nutshell. Um, yeah. And my cousin's actually a teacher of Sicilian literature and language. And there are dictionaries that'll give you the entire Italian language translated into Sicilian. And it's that much that different. <laughs> Love it. Exactly. And so yeah. what's happening is, is um, Margaret has read and heard about Mazzini, uh, Giuseppe Mazzini, and he was um, a group called Young Italy. And they wanted to create a union, right? Which is what we did among all our various territories, right? All our, our you know, we, we became a union. So uh-huh. there, it was like getting a chance to live through our revolution to experience another country doing it. Yeah. And I think that's what drew her. Exactly. Because you're seeing history like creating itself. Exactly. Right? You're and- meeting the founders. Exactly. Exactly. I, I feel like there's a lot that we don't necessarily talk about um, with when we talk about the transcendentalists, but like the Revolutionary War and all of that stuff that happened literally in their backyard. The backyard of the old manse is the Old North Bridge, where, you know, the shot heard around the world and, and all of this stuff in 1775. And the transcendentalists happening in like 1830, 1840, some of those guys are still around and it's still like the legend. So, you know, anytime that you can be there at the birth of a new country? Yes, of course. Why would you not want to be? It's, exactly. it's like it's like going to a startup or something. You want to get in on the ground floor. Yeah. And here's the person to send in terms of what Horace Greeley may be thinking. I mean, she knows how many languages. So she's going to be comfortable anywhere. And maybe a woman can get more information from people, can get into different parts of society, right? right. That a general, a military guy, maybe not. Because she's not intimidating in a separate country where they don't know all of the stuff that she knows. Like her reputation does not precede her. She's just a woman. She's in skirts. Right. right. You know, why don't I tell her all my secrets? You know? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I, you know, and but of course she's also an excellent writer. And that again is what he needs. You're gonna get there, you're gonna get the information quick, you're gonna give it to me so I can have it in the, in the newspaper, and that will I have the scoop. 
right? It's yeah. all about who gets the scoop first. Yeah. Well, and and so she she's documented as the first female like international correspondent and war correspondent, right? Exactly. Exactly. And again, now she even parallels the transcendentalists. We could parallel a little bit with the Algonquin Roundtable because Dorothy Parker and Edna Ferber are just a couple of the only women allowed in that. Yeah, around that table. Absolutely. And Dorothy Parker, especially like I would love to see Dorothy Parker and Margaret Fuller at the same party, frankly. <laughs> oh, they would be one upping each other. Right. Cool. So so she gets to Italy and like what is her assignment to like write every week or just whenever she wants or whatever um, dispatches. So because, of course, we don't have as fast a communication as one would love. So you, you've got to get whatever you get when you get it. You have to get to a place where you can transmit that information in the midst of there's little battles happening everywhere. You know, she's just in Rieti, which is right outside of Rome. And that's where Giuseppe Garibaldi, who is the man who united Italy, right? That's his thing. And that's where I came more modern day. Ooh, look at that. Come, yeah. yeah to, uh, I was actually. Doing... I, I feel like during this conversation, you should just be like, and this is the book I wrote. And then this is the book I wrote. And this. <laughs> Well, this one, I was asked to do a historical novel based on Garibaldi, who is this hero in Italy um, for organizing. And what happened was he and his wife, Anita, who's a Brazilian woman, because he left Italy, he went to Brazil, tried to get some stuff happening in Brazil, didn't work, he failed, but he learned so much. And there were a ton of Italian people living in Brazil. And they knew that his goal was to unite Italy, their home country. And so his wife, Anita, came with him to do that. And she's another fascinating woman. And the fact that she and Margaret are going to become friends because they become nurses together, taking care of the soldiers who fall in this battle. Wow. And that fascinates me. Yeah. Um, and it fascinates me because they're also having relationships in their lives because Anita had been married to someone else and she ran away with Garibaldi. Her <laughs> husband was a, an abuser and a terrible guy. Oh, and wow. then he eventually yeah. died. So they were able to get married. But they had a couple of kids outside of wedlock. That sounds and, familiar. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, hello, Margaret's going to show up, right? With Asili, yeah. who's a beautiful, gorgeous man who's also fighting for Italy. Yep. And they're not married, but they do get that little secret marriage in before the baby's born because that's very Catholic. As long thing. as everything's legal, right? Like that that's, that, uh, that's actually what matters. Yeah. Well, because, you know, we forget nowadays because it's not a big deal to us, but it was all about inheritance. Yep. If you were not the legal child, you would not inherit any of the father's money or land or title in this case. Yeah. So, you know, she definitely wanted to make, I assume she wanted to make sure her child would be given all that he was owed. Right. Because the, and I'm going to pronounce this incorrectly, like what's his, what's his title? Mar Marches, Marchese? Marchese. Marquise, yes. So he, so he has a title, um, the man that she falls in love with, and that she wants to, you know, not only make sure that her kid has it, but um, like to like, in America, we don't really have titles. We don't really understand that level of society. But over there, it's it's a thing. It's you know very much it's a big thing. Even if there's no money associated with it, there's an honor to it. It, you right. are of the upper classes, even if you don't have the money to go with it. And that's a big deal. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, and, and, and also another important point you had, you had mentioned this before. Um, so Garibaldi's wife had like gone into battle, like really with a baby, like on her, <laughs> it's like, she's literally, she's not just a nurse. She's, she's also nursing. Like yeah. while she's on the battlefront, right? That's so beautifully said. That's exactly right, right? She's gonna, I, yeah. She, um, they end up having four children, and um, this there's a statue of her in Rome because Mussolini tried to use her reputation to support his work. Look how dedicated she was to her country. Uh, there's a statue of her with the child at her breast while she's right, and she was a great horsewoman, and she trained the cavalry. Uh, the men trusted her because Garibaldi trusted her. Right. Uh, but of course, after they had a couple of kids, when they're in Reedy and they're doing all this stuff, it was like, you, now you can't risk yourself dying. So please stay behind. And behind meant you're dealing with the bloody leftovers. Uh, you know, we're not even in mash days where you've got legitimate drugs to help people. I mean, they're just, it's carnage. And, yeah. you're in the midst of it. and that's what her and Margaret were doing, working together in this hospital while they had their kids around and their men were off and maybe the report the next body that comes in could be your husband. 
my God, right? And she's like right at the front lines. She's doing all of these dispatches. And then she's also writing essentially the the history of this very tight period, right? So she goes like, what was it? Like 1847, something like that. The quote that I read was from 1848. Mm -hmm. Um, And her plan was to document the whole thing, which would have been such an incredible from an American perspective. And with this idea of we did it and now you're doing it too. And of course, Italy will complete this in 1860, which is when we're breaking apart. Right. <laughs> so right. it's such an interesting parallel history. Yeah, exactly. I think my, my biggest regret is I want I wanted to read that book. Right. And it's so, gonna go down. I yeah, I mean let's, let's talk, let's talk about the most heartbreaking piece of this story because Margaret has been fighting her whole life to get recognized. She has done all the hard work. She's like literally shown up at the battlefield, right? And in addition to all of the work that she's done for women, she's also fought to have a beautiful marriage that is a love marriage, it's legal. And she has a child, which I, you know, as a, as a woman, you know, we wouldn't necessarily call her a feminist, but I like of her day, I think she was a pretty strong feminist and she might not have ever had that vision for herself. So she has this beautiful vision. She has a manuscript. She has like an 18 month old child. She has a new husband and she says, why don't I go back to America? Right. uh, I mean, it sounds like a, such a smart idea. I mean, you know, it is the it is the classic. Let's ride the Titanic because it's the opening voyage and it's going to be the coolest thing to do. And you're like, no, 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 no. Take the next boat. Please exactly. Take the next boat. Yeah. And and so I had mentioned she had nightmares when she was a kid, and these were nightmares that involved like drowning and being subsumed in the waves. And this is like a recurring idea in her life. And even before she takes off, um, she tells, I think one of her, one of her poet friends, Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to forget her name now, but she, she, she tells this dream to one of her friends, like the night before she leaves. And she's afraid of, you know, not surviving the trip. And the trip is horrible, right? I think the captain actually dies. Mm -hmm. So like the first mate or whatever is in charge and he doesn't really know how to read things like maps. He doesn't really know about things like rocks. Yes. Well, and the idea of the shoals and how close do you get and all those things. And, you know, speaking of the dream before we get past that, you know, that's also true. They say that's true of Amelia Earhart. As she was taking off, she told, and it might've been Adela Rogers St. John's, a friend of hers, I don't remember which, that she didn't think she was going to come home. Yeah. So. Elizabeth Barrett Browning, I think. It's, yes. Is, yes, is the that's right. Name. Because Margaret yeah. got together with the Brownings when she was in Europe. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, yes. Yeah. So it's this, it's this, you know, long, terrible voyage. Everybody gets sick. I think her, her child gets all, like almost violently ill for a couple of days. And they're actually concerned that he's not going to survive. But then, you know, he miraculously gets better. And it's like this, it's this Hollywood story of like, you know, just, you just have to keep fighting because, you know, fight through one more trial, fight through one more trial. And they literally get to Fire Island in New York, just off the shore of Fire Island. And do you want to talk about the storm or do you want to talk about this moment? The combination of the storm and the crashing and and uh, what kills me is you're so close. But you can't swim that far unless you're like an excellent swimmer. And that nobody, there are people that literally loot the boat and the stuff that's falling off in the water. They're more interested in getting the free stuff they can sell than the people from there to here. And it's not that far. It's so not that far. And you're on the boat, just like the Titanic, knowing that you have no way out. I mean, that's, we're talking a good eight or 10 hours of understanding that you're going to die and you can't do anything about it. I can't even, I can't even, I can't even imagine that. Exactly. Exactly. And, and so like to refer back to your own history and your own skill set, you are an amazing screenwriter and you've, you've written like, and you're, you know, obviously teaching in an MFA program about how to construct stories and how to teach this kind of narrative. And there's a part of me that, you know, either wants to, you know, anchor her whole story in this moment of shipwreck, uh, you know, where you have these 10 hours where you can review a life, 
you know, or, you know, to maybe start something by saying, like, I can just imagine Margaret saying, I don't want to be defined by the shipwreck. Yes, you don't. And yet it, it doesn't, it doesn't. She still has all these other things going for her, but we're as humans, as Americans, that voyeuristic tragedy. Come on, that's why we're still talking about the Titanic, really. Yeah. I mean, and how yeah. many movies do we need about that? Um, it's very difficult. And yet a tragedy is a, a narrative that we're used to, right? We do Romeo and Juliet a million times. There's mm -hmm. a reason for tragedies to exist. Um, but I don't know, because I guess in Romeo and Juliet, you, we learn the lesson that the parents being so separate caused this, and we could stop the hatred. You know, it's right. the same West Side, West Side Story. Stop the hatred because this is what it leads to. There's, there's a message. There is no message to her loss. We've learned nothing from that. And I think that's why it's harder, because I've tried to do, I would love to do a Margaret Fuller movie, but that part of it is just too sad for people to want to take on. Right, right. And I, and I feel like this is something that historians, when you discover her story, you you try to figure out, so what have we learned from a woman who sort of goes beyond her station in life and accomplishes all these amazing things? Is it that she does get punished in the end? Or is it something like, I would, I would love to have the idea of like her, her spirit is just interrupted and shifted to a different plane or something, because I think that's such a not American way to think, but it is the best. <laughs> yeah. Cause I hate the other one. You're right. The other one's terrible because right? it does right? like, Oh, look, you did everything against the rules and you paid for it, which is not a message we want to share. But the yeah. idea that maybe you achieved, it's a little Jonathan Livingston Siegel. You achieved the peak and now you move on to that next plane that we, we don't know. So we can't understand. Exactly. Because I think she was coming back to participate in a lot of the early feminist or like women's like suffrage movements. And she was scheduled yeah. to speak at, um, uh, what is it, Seneca Falls, maybe? Seneca Falls, because Lydia, again, Lydia Marie Child, who she knew in her childhood, right, becomes a big leader of that, one of the founders of that event. And of course, you'd want Margaret Fuller. I mean, my God, she's world known. She's world traveled. She's the perfect example of what women can accomplish if they are not given the rules and requirements that society was forcing on them. Exactly what Seneca Falls was meant to counteract. Right, right. And so, so like, I would love to, to think, like, or like, this would be my narrative that her spirit is hovering and blessing over the suffrage movement, or, you know, she's working in all these ways that we don't even realize, you know, whether that's so. true or and, not. You know, Magical realism, maybe. <laughs> Would be the way to go. I think so. Well, you know, the same is true. Again, I go back to Anita Garibaldi only because they were friends and Anita dies first. She dies. Um, she gets sick on the travels and she doesn't see the success of her husband or her children at that point. Yeah, exactly. And and so they both. And, and, they, and then to be appropriated by Mussolini in a statue. That's also something that Americans have done, certainly with their with Confederate heroes or whatever in the 1920s and 30s, when we're kind of like, all right, who should we be honoring in the South? They're like, these are this is the history that we need to hold up. And I think only now are we sort of like, wait a minute, what's going on? Right. Well, again, being from Ohio, I was always like, but Grant won? Grant won. Grant won against the greatest general ever. So doesn't that make him the greater greatest general? Like right. that logic, logic. Yeah. That's how it works in like boxing and stuff like that. Shouldn't it be the same in war? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But you're right. It's, you know, the, to not know that. Um, but she knew that she created her children and that, um, that she lived a life of love, which is true of Margaret as well. She yeah. found a man, as you said earlier, that she could love who loved her for who she was and didn't, expect her to give that up in order to be his wife yeah and that had to be crazy because he was an italian right and he's from an earlier era we're not even talking about feminism in italy at the time so the fact that he was open to that is it, uh, he's a fascinating character that we of course lost any chance to understand more deeply through her Right. Well, talk, so talk about him a little bit more, because I feel like he's sort of this this figure. And, you know, I want to imagine him in my in my in my mind as sort of like this, you know, super handsome, maybe not the rich guy, but, you know, definitely the man of quality that we all aspire to meet. Well, he went against his family as well, because they were not for the unit unification of Italy. 
So he lost his, they, they wrote him off, if you will. So that's why he doesn't have any money. Um, he's not going to inherit any. And the family does have lands and all that stuff, but they were against the unification. And many people were because they were happy with whichever country was running their section of Italy, mm-hmm. or they didn't appreciate um, the king and they didn't want the king to be king over all of Italy or lots of different reasons that they were against yeah. it. And so, yeah, they write him off. And because he married her and she wasn't Catholic. And this is huge, obviously, yes. back in the day. Yes. Um, I actually tell a story. My mom uh, put together her brother, three uh, children of Sicilian immigrants, only one son. My mother put her brother together with a woman who wasn't Catholic, and they fell in love, and they got married. She did, um, she did become Catholic because, you know, she converted because she knew she had to. But on the day of the wedding, my mother was the maid of honor. My grandmother was tying the bow on her dress. And as she walked out into the church, the last thing her mother said to her was, I'll never forgive you for this. That was 1950. Oh, 1950 my God. 1950 in America. That was oh like, you. It, this is a mismatched marriage. Yes. And, yeah. You're, so you're think about it now fail. in 1847. Exactly. You're doomed to fail before you walk down the aisle, just so you know. Just so you know. Right. And I'll never, I, yet like this is so against, you know. So he, yeah. he gave up everything for her, which again tells us, how important she was and how amazing she had to be. Right. People don't do that. Right. Yeah. And, and he's, you know, and he's there and they're so also, and here, so here's a question that I'm never really sure of. They were coming for a visit or were they coming to move permanently mm-hmm. or was it sort of, they were I believe they were, work? I believe the idea was they were going to move permanently because she could do more work there and she wanted to publish the book and it had to be published in the United States. So mm-hmm. even if, yeah, maybe not permanent is the wrong way to say it. It was going to be a period of time so that peace could be done. And the kind of, she knew that the United States needed to come and support what was happening in Italy as well. So I think it's twofold. Her career is going to move forward with this. And he's thinking he's going to help get the kind of support because Garibaldi lived in the States for a little bit too, after one of his failures. Um, so he knew that if you got people there on your side, you would have the support you needed. So they had business reasons as well as I'm sure she kind of wanted to show off her kid to her friends. Exactly. Because as you said earlier, that wasn't part of her planned life story. Yeah. And then it, be, I mean, and I, I, when I was a kid, I was never going to have kids. Because I thought that's not something I want to do. And then I changed my mind at 32 because a writer friend of mine actually said, if you want to be a writer and you want all the experiences that a writer can have, you're turning down an experience that only half the planet can have. Right. And it was a conversation, which is, again, makes me think about Margaret talking to these women. What are the possibilities in your life? And what have you told yourself you should or shouldn't do based on what society will say about you? And I did think having a kid would get in the way of having a career. And then I realized, no, because you can do it your way. And Margaret did, right? right? I think in that moment, in those periods in her life, she was really happy. And I think that was, you know, the other reason she wanted to come back and show everybody, look, I did it all. Yeah, you can have it all. And she did. You yeah. can. And she yeah. did. Exactly. She did. So- so let me ask you a question, because um, I know in some of your other writing, you have um, compared the way that Italians were seen in America um, as, like, as a little bit parallel to the way African Americans were seen that they were not they were considered you know they were considered swarthy they were they had you know you know dark look I and I can say this because I'm Portuguese you know and I've always asked for white it's never ever been a question but you know I I am I always wonder what it would have been like had I magically appeared you know in Concord in 1840 would I have been seen as an immigrant as an outsider as someone who you know doesn't look like the you know traditional um, you know, whatever, you know, like, like, you know, not a daughter of the American revolution, essentially. True. Well, so yeah, so obviously. I her... would... Go ahead. I was just going to say, yes, I would, I wouldn't exactly use the word parallel because of course, Italians were never slaves, but actually some who were shipped here were mistakenly sold to slavery because they couldn't speak the language and nobody understood and they were dark. Right. Um, there are stories of that. And of course, the biggest lynching, the most, the largest mass lynching in America happened to a group of Italian men um, in Louisiana. Oh my God. Post slavery now. Yeah. It was, yeah. Um, um, and they weren't considered white. 
um, because of that. Now, and, and largely we're talking about Southern Italians, Sicilians and Southern Italians, because Northern Italians look more Swiss, they look more German, they are blonder and blue-eyed. It's, it's Frank Sinatra versus Dean Martin. <laughs> exactly, right? So, But any so- group that comes into this country, sadly, we sort of do the whole, oh, you're at the bottom of the barrel. It, it would say, you know, no, no dogs or dagos allowed, you know, no dagos should apply for this job. There was yeah. discrimination. Yeah. I'm two generations away from that. So it didn't happen to me, but I understood that it ha- happened to my grandfather and I understood how that got in his way. Yeah. Um, now, yeah. the other thing is we're a weird country because I also did a book on this guy, Filippo Mazze. He's an Italian who comes to the United States in the 1700s and lives on the plantation next door to Thomas Jefferson. And Mazze didn't use slaves. He brought Italian serfs who were not treated great, but were not owned to right. work. Though he wanted to grow wine in Virginia. He thought to bring the wine business to Virginia. And he's that's the guy, that's this is off topic, but he wrote yeah. All Men Are Created Equal in a pamphlet that he worked with Jefferson and he was invited to the Continental Congress, but he couldn't, he spoke, he wrote English and five other languages, but he didn't think he could keep up with the verbal debate fast enough. So he's not in the movie 1776 because he didn't go. But when Jefferson wrote the declaration, he cribbed that phrase. And I'm not making this up because the, the Congress in like the 80s or something did actually put that into the congressional record. That that's where that first phrase first appeared in America was from this Italian immigrant. I love it. I love it. And yeah, he was like, as normal as anyone because he owned land and he was just one of the many people living here, like the Scots. And, but there wasn't a flood of Italians. It's in the it's in the early part of the 1900s when we get the flood of poor Italians. It's right. the poor immigrants we never want. The rich guys we're okay with. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And and so so, but the, my 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 question that I didn't get a chance to fully form yet um, is: Do you think that Margaret was maybe savvy enough to understand that her son? might be seen as one of those Italians that didn't have money and maybe his skin was a little bit darker and, you know, maybe she was trying to test the waters and sort of see, was he being accepted in Concord? And then as a young man, because I feel like we're, we're very aware of the precarious nature, unfortunately, of being a young boy of color going out into the world. And it suddenly struck me that it's entirely possible that Margaret might have that in the back of her mind that she has to be on guard for this as her boys. It, it makes up. perfect sense, right? It makes perfect sense that she would have been testing the waters for all of it. Cause she's also yeah. married to a foreigner right, exactly. and a Catholic and Catholics were not accepted in the country at that time either because of, you know, loving the Pope and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, so she probably was. I would say it's probably that her son probably wasn't necessarily, um, didn't necessarily have a darker skin because Giovanni comes from more and more northern part of the country. Okay. Um, and we probably at that time, we weren't as discriminatory because Italy was kind of part of Europe and the France and the, you know, Lafayette was a good guy and we're sort of immigrants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I don't think it, it's, it happens in the early 1900s because that's when the, the great mass of unwashed poor folks show up and we want to put them to work in our crummy jobs and our seamstress factories and things like that. And the guys right. are working on the railroad, but yeah. Like we do with all the immigrants. Yeah. Sadly. Yeah. yeah. All the immigrants, every, you know, and the problem is, or the luck, the privilege is we assimilate so that we look white, which of course is bullshit. There's no such thing as white. It makes me crazy. Um, <laughs> Caucasian, know. you know, I always tell students Caucasian is the dumbest word in the world because there's no land of cock. Exactly. <laughs> it's literally the dude, right? The dude who studied all the skulls to hi- do the hierarchy of all the different ethnicities. He thought the prettiest skulls came from the people who lived in the Caucasus Mountains of Russia. And so he qualified them as, as Caucasian, but that's not a thing. Right. Right. Yeah. And Ibram X. Kendi is writing, you know, a lot of really great books, how to be anti-racist um, and uh, stamped from the beginning, which goes back and, and sort of traces the history of how, you know, the popes centuries ago were interpreting the Bible and how people were like, OK, this is the mark of Cain or, you know, Ham and all of these stories. And this is why, you know, or, or this is this is the arbitrary reasoning that we have for trying to put everybody in a cast that we're not going to talk about, you know? 
Oh yeah. Oh, totally. I mean, there's a whole, you know, the whole books on, you know, working toward whiteness and how whiteness was invented and all of that stuff and how the Irish became white, right. And moved into another category. Nothing changed except, you know, the world decided, okay, we like those guys or we're we're okay with those guys. It's just, yeah, it's such a a construct, which is one of those academic words, but you know, yeah, that's what it is. It's all made up. Yeah. So wait, so speaking of constructs, because I do want to get back to Margaret and talk about how um, after her um, after her passing, after her death, after this horrible shipwreck, how Emerson was sort of one of the first people to sort of jump to the fore and say, I'm going to write a biography of Margaret and I'm going to cross out all of the parts of her that I think might be offensive. And so do you want to talk about some of the biographies and stuff that originated after she passed and how, you know, those versions of her might, like the older versions, the contemporary versions might not be so accurate? I think that's very true. And of course, as you said earlier, that's true in so much of our history. Someone decided what we should share, what was acceptable. Um, and you could, I, I think from Emerson's point of view, I understand that he wanted people to love his friend. So he was he was filtering out what he thought would get in their way of understanding how great she was. But then, of course, the next guy reads that book and only reports that much and that much. I mean, it's true also of the various iterations of the diary of Anne Frank. Her father only let certain things out because he didn't want people to know that she sometimes wrote that she was mad at her mother because that was the woman he loved. And he wanted, you know, and then later people have added those things in to say, but here's the real picture. doesn't mean she was a terrible little girl. It just means every teenager goes, my mom is making me crazy. <laughs> exactly. And it just gives her the more humanity to know all those dimensions. And I think, yes, that's what's missing in these early biographies. Um, and we have to go back and really look at her writing, what exists, mm-hmm. um, and then analyze that to get a sense of, of who she was. But I think her activities tell us that. So teaching for Bronson Alcott tells us she was okay with an interracial group. She right. thought that, you know, desegregation was the proper thing to do. Um, or she, we wouldn't do that. You could work for somebody else. You could tutor for anybody. And yeah. you chose that job. And you knew it was controversial and other people would judge you by it. And so you for me, I think guns and, you know, she was, she was, she was, I, and I feel like having been discriminated against herself as she was growing up and trying to fight for her own education, that she was more than, as, even with the conversations, she's just like, yes. let's throw open the doors and help people find themselves and find their own curiosity and, you know, engage them in conversations. Exactly. And, you know, that is really what we're learning, because you mentioned, of course, all the, all the um, anti-racial things that we're trying to do now. It's about conversation about, look, acknowledge this, name what it is, and then make sure you're working against it. Make sure you recognize that that's a, a, a confirmation bias or a, yeah. um, any of those many, my brain is not remembering them all right now, but. Hey, no, no, it's like all of this inherited hierarchy, yes. you know, mm-hmm. like crap <laughs> and it, all of this stuff. Yeah, yeah. that's, that's arbitrary. Up- and, and to keep questioning what we have learned. Yes, yes. Yeah. And whether or not it affects the thing we're doing, like we're doing a Dean search and there was a little discussion about, well, some of these people have only been at their place a couple of years. Don't we want longevity? And then someone said, you know, in a younger generation, they move around a lot. They don't think I'm going to be here for 20. They, that isn't the value. So don't judge yeah. them by that because you don't know how they value. It. And I was like, Ooh, good point. Exactly. Exactly. Like, I feel like, especially with the internet, like a lot of the paradigm has been changed and shifted and we're constantly trying to reframe like all of the, you know, traditional values and sort of say, all right, well, what matters? And then what are the new things, you know? And I'm sure that Margaret felt the same way where people were like, you know, we have women, women aren't supposed to be this smart. Women aren't supposed to be able to hold their own in conversation. What's going on? And, you know, it's so funny because can you imagine what she would have done in this world of the internet it, it, to disperse her ideas in all the many ways, whether it's on a website or a blog or whether she would have been, you know, part of a podcast, as you said earlier, yeah. the ability to spread your ideas so far and wide would have been such a, such a joy, I think. Exactly. Exactly. And, and she's one of the people who would also like, it's not, it's not just her ideas that were radical, but she was also, she was the first, I think, to um, interpret, uh, to, um, to translate Goethe. Yes. English, right. So like, 
it's not like she's just coming at it from, you know, uh, here I am, this this person who's uneducated. She has the chops to help, you know, place everything and give everything context. Um, one of the, so I, I run a group on Facebook, as you know, called Transcendentalist 2021, where we're trying to bring in as much as possible in, in terms of all the new articles coming out. And the first book we looked at and the first author that we had back in January was, um, was Margaret and her book, Women, Woman in the, 20, in the 19th Century. See, I want to say women in the 21st century. <laughs> she should be in the 21st century. Exactly, exactly. But it, it's it's a really dense text that has all of these amazing little jewels in it. And I would highly recommend that. And also her other book, Summer on the Lakes, yes, which, absolutely. you know, was written you know, like 1844, where she's just going to the Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. And she's essentially writing, you know, a version of Walden of her own and she's talking oh. about native americans and all of the the this this it's a travel memoir it's a you know it's a journalistic you know um like it's again dispatches from her journey and, and we forget how important the great lakes were right before the country's humongous this is how we travel all the goods and whatnot i mean uh, again from ohio from cleveland um mm -hmm. And just thinking about all the people I know who live in that area, it was so important that the Erie Canal, all these things that provided the transportation on water long before we have it any other way. It's huge. I mean, so to go to the Great Lakes, they were, they mean nothing now. Kids are like, what's the Great Lakes? I, I remembered, like we had to remember their names and all this stuff because times change. But they were, they were such a thing for her to memorialize, if you will. And traveling alone as a woman. You know, and, and she's, and I, so I, 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 I don't want to gloss over the piece about the Native Americans because she also was able to travel um, and witness the tribe coming together in a very peaceful manner. And she was able to witness a lot of stuff up close. And Henry David Thoreau, you know, makes almost the same journey, you know, 20 years later, and suddenly everybody's at war and the tone of you know polite intolerance that the government had towards the Native Americans has suddenly turned into this whole bloody battle, and it's very very ugly. So he doesn't have that same uh, you know opportunity to experience um, and witness um, what it's what it's like to just you know hang out and observe people that and he and he was always fascinated by Native Americans and could never but never really was able to sort of crack the crack the the nut of really why he um why he found them to be he, like he, he didn't have he didn't have a lot of actual encounters with native americans in the same way she did but i also think that's the difference in their styles i think that through her conversations through her own curiosity she was interested in what other people thought you know and i think thoreau was interested in what he thought which is fine that's what he did but yeah. you know, i think there's a difference there yeah yeah which is why she could go to other countries and be able to report on them and understand. It's like sociology, sociological work too, not just journalism. Ethno ethnography and yeah, and yeah. really studying, yeah. studying people up close by, you know, taking them at, or maybe it's beyond ethnography because it's sort of, it's, it's relating to other humans as human rather than the trying humanist. to. Yeah, yeah. That puts her in Eleanor Roosevelt category. Exactly. An another great woman who doesn't get the full appreciation for what she's for the work that she does. No, I have a friend who just wrote a, a biography of, I mean, there's a million of them, but a new one um, as part of a group that I'm editing. And um, she discovered in letters would have only recently been let out. It's always about what's recently been let out, like you were saying, the most recent stuff, yeah. that um, the reason that FDR learned about the Manhattan Project is because the, his people weren't letting the scientists talk to him. But one of them was in a social club that Eleanor was in. So he got her to invite him to the White House. He told her what they were worried about, and she told FDR. Wow. Like, like she was the leeway for that. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Like the contact point where... Yes. Yeah. I, like, and when she understood how important it was, she knew he had to know. So yeah. it was all about her. And just nobody thinks that. No one gives her that much credit. I mean, we give her a lot of credit, but there's so many things we're learning that women have done so much extra that got left behind. Yeah, yeah, to, to bring together all the pieces of the puzzle. Imagine how different history would be. 
right? I've often said our mistake, and other people are talking about this too, I don't think we should wait until later to teach you history. And I don't think we should keep doing the whole story in every year that you do it, like eighth grade and 10th grade or whatever. I think we should start in second grade, the beginning of the story. And you don't get to the end of it till you're in 12th grade. And then you don't have to have women's history and African-American history and Asian-American history. And in, in, in the East Coast, I've seen Italian-American history, which we don't have in California, which I That's wish. Um, <laughs> put them all in one story, like all right. of them in the same. And it just takes that much longer to tell it. But we have 12 years. They're in school for 12 years. Exactly. exactly. Or like I, I have this fantasy of doing some kind of like virtual reality thing or some kind of re- relationship map where yeah you can and it, as you're saying like maybe it starts in second grade or maybe it starts young or it can even be something that people can do throughout their lives because there are people who continue to learn beyond you know what actually after they leave college believe it or not you know and but just just travel from sort of one lesson or one person or one event to the other and be immersed in it because i agree i feel like this artificial framing of history is this it's done a little bit like it's done to be facile. It's done to be, you know, these chapters that we can easily finish. And I remember not getting past World War II for most of high school because we would always run out of time. So we never got yes. to be right. And it, I was always never. like, wait a minute, what, what, what about the 60s? You know, and of course, that was probably because when we were younger, that was still too controversial to cover in school. So better that you finish with the greatest generation. We saved the world from Hitler. We're all great. And we don't have to get to the murkier thing where we're not sure what that was all about. Exactly. End of story. Let's not even talk about Korea. Yeah. Just, just, right. watch, yeah. No. Yeah, just watch MASH and watch like shows from the 60s and that'll be close enough. Yeah. Right. Bewitched will tell you everything you need to know about the 60s. Well, so actually, so here, here is a great way that I will, you know, pat myself on the back for this segue. Um, so I, one of my favorite books ever And this is yours, um, Why the Monkeys Matter. And I would actually blame the monkeys on my fascination with history because it's it's an amazing show that is very easy to watch and doesn't get the credit it deserves. And I think even at the time that they were making it, they were just like, let's make something that everybody might think is a kid's show. So the producers went on to do other movies, um, other way more controversial issues. Um, but I think it all started with the monkeys. I totally yeah. did. I totally did. And understanding the the media of the 60s, again, it's so interesting. The 60s, the 1830s and 40s, right? There's this, and even the 18, so just before World War I, so the 19-teens. Very right. interesting periods where whenever we get out of one war, we try to work on making ourselves better because we don't have to work on fighting somebody. And if we put more energy into that, I've always been fascinated by that, you know, that moment in our... Fascinated by that moment in our history, fascinated by the way that we just keep retelling history. I feel like it's always, it's always, it's a constant challenge. So I have been honored to be able to have this conversation with you. Um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what your next books are, um, the articles and all the lectures that you put out. You have a really great social media presence. So let me, let me end the show right there. I'm so excited. I was in Concord many a year ago doing the whole visit and seeing the Alcott home and all that. And I'm dying to come back. Yay. We would love to have you. And I would love to take you around. And again, my fantasy is to do a Pokemon Go of Concord. So I'll be there. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Thank you all. See you all next time. Take care.